to thank uh, Chris and Natalie for this wonderful opportunity to really share um, some of my life experiences. It took me some time to actually think about and reflect on what was the question that I thought was most important. And um, thinking back on myself as a student, an athlete, a sister, a friend, a hockey coach, a teacher, and my current role as a vice principal, you know, I thought, what's really, really important about education? And really, it's we're taking care of people's children. Every one of those kids should feel good about walking into those buildings, into our buildings, and me included. I want to thank um, Natalie and Chris for having Sir Ken Robinson's speech because I think that gives you a framework. I do apologize because I work in one of those schools that kills kids' creativity. <laughs> But I also want to let you know, some, on a positive note, that over a thousand fellow educators who service over hundreds of thousands of students actually heard Sir Ken Robinson speak about that, uh, the exact topic that you saw two years ago. So we are moving in a direction, I think that is a healthy one, where we are looking at servicing the needs of all children. So that being, uh, bearing that in mind, I'm going to share with you some grassroots experiences that then touch on what some of the research says. For myself, um, I was blessed, uh, as Sir Ken Robinson talked about, with a mathematical mind and an academic mind. So um, unlike many of my friends, my siblings, school was a positive experience for me. I got to uh, experience a lot of success. I felt great about myself. And I couldn't wait to get up every day and go to school. But really, and we heard a little bit about empathy today, shouldn't every person feel that way? And shouldn't we all um, feel validated uh, about our authentic self uh, when we come into school buildings? So fast forward now to me as a, a hockey coach. Um, I worked with kids or coached kids and families from you know, vast uh, backgrounds, uh, economic, socioeconomic, uh, big girls, small girls, girls of all different sizes. But the one thing that we could bring into our dressing room was that we cared about each other, we worked as hard as we could, and that the outcome didn't matter. What mattered was that each and every one of us gave our best effort every game. And what was important was the relationships and the fact that these young girls were developing to be the best that they could possibly be. And I transitioned that into the classroom. But I don't know if you think back on your own experience in your mathematics classes, I can tell you I wanted every child in my math classes to feel amazing, but I can tell you that I wasn't succeeding and I was frustrated. And I was spending more time in the special education department than I was in the mathematics department. And I quickly uh, moved from math into special education because I wanted to learn and understand more about how we could effectively meet the needs of not just the brightest kids, but all learners. And that led me to um, a, a fantastic opportunity to teach a group of students my very first year in special education. I'm teaching a class of 16, 16 year old boys. I call it the class of hormones. And uh, it was very interesting. I felt like uh, teaching, for those of you who are as old as I am, like Welcome Back Cotter. And uh, the, just to give you an idea as to what the culture of my classroom was like, and they're all boys, uh, miss, got to go to the washroom. And I would be like, excuse me, I'm miss. May I please go to the washroom? So first we raise our hand, then we say, miss, may I please go to the washroom? And the culture of this class eventually did shift, and these fantastic young men, you know, came to respect each other and say, you know, raise their hand and learn that they were valuable and that they were important and that what they gave off is what they got back. And I'm going to share with you stories of three of those particular boys. I've changed the names um, to respect their, uh, their identity, but I'm going to tell you some stories that help, will help you understand a little bit of my journey. So we'll start with um, a student, uh, Stephen. Stephen was a boy who came in, he was tall, he was handsome, he was very confident. He was in my class because he required some remediation with his learning skills, but uh, he was really a positive energy in my class. And it was important for my students that um, they felt safe and that they enjoyed the, the culture and the community. So at Christmas time, I always brought in those uh, nativity calendars. They, they're uh, chocolates you get, you pick a number. Um, after class one day, he came up to me to have a very candid, you know, conversation. Miss, can I talk to you for a second? I said, sure, Stephen, what's up? 
And he said, um, you know, I don't like Christmas. Christmas is not a very nice time around my, my house. Um, my father um, lost both of his parents and raised my uncle. My uncle is 15 years younger than my dad. And my dad is, uh, you know, he works in construction and he put his younger brother through school and his younger brother became an engineer. But now his younger brother doesn't talk to him anymore because he doesn't fit into his social class. And, his, and this young boy was so sad. And then, you know, it opened my eyes to realize that these kids were coming not just with their academic abilities, but with their personal stories and their life stories. Now let's shift to um, something I learned on the academic side from a student named, I'm just, I have to change his name, um, Jason. Jason was, came into my class every day full of passion. He couldn't, he was just, miss, miss, you have to look at this test. This is not fair. It's not fair, miss. And I would look, and instead of putting true and false, he put yes and no. And it was a math test, and fortunately, I had a math background, so I can engage in a conversation with him about this test, which was about trigonometry. And I looked at the result in the test, and I think it was a failing grade, but he explained to me all of the answers and that he knew and he could understand everything. And I said, well, why didn't you write that down? And then I realized um, this was a student who had a specific reading disability and writing. So I had taken those courses, but when you see the theory, it's very different than when you're actually working uh, with the child in the classroom. And I'll, I'll go so far to tell you that this boy explained to me that when you were doing trigonomic ratios and you were looking at triangles, it didn't matter how big the triangle came, became, but as long as the angles were the same, the ratio of the sides always remained the same. So when you were doing the tangent, it was always the opposite over the adjacent. And I, I was taken aback because I can tell you my university level students did not un understand trigonometry as deeply as this young man did. And this young man, um, we did do some efforts of making sure that he could go and access a resource room. So going forward, he did have the opportunity to have somebody read the questions, write the questions, but not think for him. He did, that's called an accommodation. So he did all of the, the thinking on his own. That young man is now, um, incidentally, we've heard this throughout our talks, is now actually an aircraft mechanic engineer and a pilot, a commercial pilot. He's very, very bright, but he required that accommodation. And he came back to visit um, us at high school after graduating from Centennial College to show us his marks. And his marks were substantially higher than those uh, he had earned in high school. And he went on to explain this. It's different. It's all web-based. We are um, in a, a technological age, a 21st century learners, and he fortunately was able to access all of his lessons online, and so that way could know that the carburetor, that word looked like that, and it matched the carburetor. But I can tell you this boy is brilliant. He had to um, achieve above 98% in his fine motor skills, his mechanical skills, so not to worry, to think that you're not safe on the planes, because I can tell you this boy, in some respects, especially mechanically, was brighter than most of the university level students that were coming through our school. So that's another example. The, the last example I want to share is um, a student, Paul, and this one impacted me the greatest. I had taught Paul the previous year in my mathematics class, and he had over $30,000 saved in the bank. He explained to me all about compound interest. He explained to me about annuities and miss. You should be teaching about that so we can save money. He explained about credit cards, how it was a scam, and he was a bright young man. However, his behavior was really inconsistent. And that's what I did remember as I'm teaching him the next year. And it was important to me in the classroom, as it is for most teachers, um, that my students had felt relevancy to the curriculum. So they, were, they had a meaning and a purpose. So I wanted them to work with me so I could help them discover what were their innate gifts, what were their interests, so that their pathway would be one that was appropriate for them. And I'd ask, I asked them to all read. I found you know, literature that I thought was in the middle of where they were so as not to humiliate any. Well, one student would not read, and I was angry. And, but I didn't let him know till after class, and I pulled him aside into a room, and I said, you know, Paul, you know, we have a good relationship. I taught you last year. I know that you're brilliant in math, you've been working, you've got over $30,000 saved in the bank, you're only 17. Why did you disrespect me? His eyes welled up, and he said, I can't read. 
oh, wow. Um, that had a huge impact on me. I went back into the academic resource room and I said, okay, guys, they can't read. We have to teach them how to read. Like, it doesn't matter about all, like, this boy's bright. And, you know, that really ignited, as you can see, a passion and a fire in me um, with my colleagues um, to say, you know, what can we do and how can we do it better so that this young boy feels um, as good as everybody else when they're coming into our building. Fast forward to a couple days later, I get a call in my classroom. Kylie, Kylie, Paul is down at the main office. You know, apparently he's going to, you know, in some trouble. You better call the vice principal. So I call down and I find out that Paul had had some choice words in his class in front of his peers to his teacher. Oh, I thought, oh, goodness gracious. So I called, I found out who the teacher was, I called the class. And so I asked the teacher, you know, what was the activity that was going on with Paul? And this was a very young, progressive teacher, and I knew she was, like, you know, on the cutting edge. So she was doing a cooperative exercise where they, they were doing the activity in groups using collaboration, and they had a reader and a recorder, and you can probably see where I'm going, and uh, somebody who was keeping time and somebody who was making sure everybody was on task. I said, okay, so what was Paul's role? He was asked to be a reader. So I ask you, uh, which is the lesser of two evils? Be Paul, sorry, being humiliated in front of his peers who had no idea that he couldn't read, he was a very bright young man, or him having some choice words to get the heck out of that situation. So nonetheless, um, we did work it out that he apologized to his teacher. Um, we worked on some accommodations and with the goodwill and grace of a fantastic principal and superintendent, we actually were able to come together to start a program, a reading program, where we very early diagnosed the kids that were in that kind of situation, looked at some research-based programs, utilized our own students who are already in our building to provide the support. And I can tell you, I'm not no longer at that particular school, but I know that they are still doing those kinds of diagnostics and they are still looking to make sure that they capture the students like Paul and like Jason and like, I'm trying to think of the name I gave Steve, <laughs> Steven, to make sure that, um, that their needs are being met. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, it's about every single one of the kids that are coming into our building being met where they're at. And so here's my opportunity now to connect this to what does the research say. Well, I would implore you all to look up the following, and I'm using my uh, 21st century cheat notes. Um, I would ask you to have a look, of course, at more of Ken Robinson's work. It's phenomenal in the area of education. Dalton Sherman, a young 10-year-old boy who did, at, at the time, I think he's maybe 14 now, but he did an amazing presentation to all of the educators in the Dallas, Texas uh, area about the power of belief and believing in children and believing in your colleagues and just having that, that faith. Um, I'd ask that you look uh, at the TED Talk by Rita Pearson. She talks about the importance of every child having a champion. She quotes Stephen Covey who says, we need to understand first in order to be understood. Talks about the importance of apologizing. Talks about the importance of that being a champion for those kids so that they feel that they're respected and valued. Um, I ask that you look uh, at the work of Ross W. Green, uh, an amazing psychologist who himself learned it's not kids do well if they want to, it's kids do well if they can. And if kids can't do well, it's incumbent upon us to figure out what's getting, into the way, getting in the way. And that's not done in isolation, that's done collaboratively because there are lots of reasons why kids may not be doing well. Could be a diagnosed learning disability, could be because they're not eating, could be because their parents are going through a divorce, father lost his job, mother lost her job, a variety of reasons as to why kids may not be engaged. Um, I'd ask that you look at the work of uh, Dr. Mel Levine. Unfortunately, his life ended tragically. However, the work that he did is incredible in understanding all kinds of minds. And he talks about the importance of strength-focused curriculum, not focusing. I was lucky that I didn't grow up in a school where you had to do decorating and our artistry, but that you were allowed to do math and science. Well, why can't all kids' strengths be recognized in the school system? Still remediate the weaknesses because we want to empower them to um, not be victims but to be powerful in the world not to be taken advantage of etc but why not be focusing on every child's strength so look at the work of dr. Mel Levine um, and the new 
growth mindset research that's out there that really speaks to most of the, the speakers who spoke here today. And the importance of understanding, as um, Ken Robinson mentioned, intelligence is dynamic. It is not static. We're living in a dynamic world and we have to let kids believe that the process, that effort is more important than the outcome. So looking at the fact of it's called growth mindset. The speaker is Eduardo Piceno. It's a powerful TEDx talk and it taps into the research. So what I would like to leave you with is sharing with you the philosophy that I learned through working with the students but that uh, Ross W. Green has done extensive research on and that is kids do well if they can, people do well if they can, let's work collaboratively to help all of us work at help at finding out what's in the way so that we can all live happier, more prosperous lives. Thank you.